Okay, clearly continuing our conversation about real property versus uh, personal property. And at this point, it's still early yet, but just so that this makes sense to you, why this is important. When we're talking about real estate, we're talking about selling real estate, what you guys will be doing in the field. If it's real property, it transfers as incident to the transaction, right? But if it's personal property, there's no contract on them. That's a completely different issue. So do you understand our significance of why it's important to understand what's real and what's personal? That's why, we're, uh, why we discuss it in this class. On this slide right here, some things you might have not even thought about. Some things you might have just simply taken as holy, which are probably actually pretty true, but we actually have a name for them. For example, we're getting ready to talk about uh, quantus naturalis versus quantus industrialis. Every once in a while, we like to throw in a little bit of Latin lingo just to make us look smarter than what we actually are. And this is a case of this. Look at the word quantus naturalis, though, and I don't know if that's the way you pronounce it or not. Not Latin. Okay, so I don't know. But anyway, does it look like natural fruits? Fruits growing naturally in the soil? These have another name. Uh, I don't know, what do you call them? They come back year after year. It starts with letter T. Perennial. That's the word I was looking for. These are your perennials. Perennials come back year after year. Can you name a few of them in your yard right now? Exactly. Say again? Exactly. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I assume you did. It, it's one of them. It's either an annual or a perennial, but they follow different rules. But, they're, both, they're both perennials. Okay, so daffodils are in fact perennials? Okay, then they count. They count, all right? I thought you were going with something more simple like a tree. That's what I would have gone for. A tree growing in your uh, yard. Those are perennials. What's that? What, the daffodil? Are you still on the daffodil or are you on the tree now? Yeah, the, perennial, the tree is a perennial. It comes back year after uh, year. It reads flowers every year every uh, year. You plant it once and it comes back year after uh, year. That's what we're talking about as far as growing seasons go. That was harder than it needed to be, Ebony. Let's try another one. Sorry. Let's try another one. How about your lawn? How about the grass? <laughs> grass comes back year after uh, year. I know maybe doing it for a while, but then it comes back year after year. You plant it once and it comes back, right? Okay. Now what's the significance of this in our conversation? If it's a fructus naturalis, if it's a fruit of the soil, comes back year after year. If it's a perennial, is it real property or is it personal property? It is real property. So is it going with the uh, property when you sell it? Is this an important concept? Yes. Yes. If you have never seen a Japanese maple, you may want to introduce yourself. And I don't know what the new exciting thing is among ornamental plants these days. But I will tell you, if you have one of these and it has value, you better watch out for that seller going under contract and then going and digging it up to take it with them. Because if it's growing in the soil, that belongs to the property unless he enters into a contractual agreement otherwise. Are you with me on that? It will happen. I actually heard of one case. I did not see this. But I actually heard of one case where someone took their lawn with them. They actually took their grass. I can't even imagine how difficult it was to take their grass to make it worth it. But apparently they had sodded the yard a few years earlier. And they said, hey, this happens all the time. On sod farms, all they do is cut it up, roll it up, throw it on the back of the truck. So that's what they did. Do you think the buyer was a little bit upset? When he got to the house and found out his lawn was gone. Yes, he was. Okay. There was a reasonable expectation it was going with the property. Now, on the other hand, when we talk about the fructus industrialis, make it easy, fruits of industry, think crops. As a matter of fact, let me give you another fancy word. If you want another fancy word to go with it here, the word implements or implements. i got to believe it's on there. Yes, it is. The word implements or implements. If you ever see the word implements, it means two actual things. They sound similar, but they're slightly uh, different. The first definition of implements is simply a crop in the field. Crops growing in the field. That's one definition of evidence. You okay with that? Yes. Crops growing in the field. Jared, why are you looking quizzically? Are you spelling that? Are you spelling or crops? Oh. It's right there. Oh. That's all there. Yeah, I've written tiny on this slide, isn't it? Implements are crops growing in the field. Okay? But here's the other definition of implements. It refers to the right of a tenant farmer to reap that which they have sown. The right to reap what you have sown. Because when we're talking about implements, these are your annuals, right? 
These are one growing season. Now, let's talk importantly about this. Are implements <coughs> considered real property or are they personal property? Personal. They're considered the personal property of the person who planted them. Okay? And again, that's why it's important for our purposes. For example, what if I buy a property? If I, well, let me rephrase that. I contract on a property in late July, but I'm not actually planning on closing it until January. I have purchased a farm. It's a big farm. And so I went into the contract in July. We're going to do our diligence and stuff, but we're not going to close until January 1st. Well, the fact of the matter is, I saw that there were corn sprouts in July when I purchased it. But is that corn going to be there in July when I close? Bless you. No, because it will have been reaped in October, right? Am I going to be mad that the property wasn't delivered with the corn? No, because I knew it was one growing season. It belonged to the person who planted it. Make sense? And then just to put one more fine point on it, this concept of tenant farming, which by the way, North Carolina still has a you know pretty broad history of uh, tenant farmers. It's not uncommon for someone to lease the land and then plant crops there and then uh, make their money off of the, the farming activity. So here's the situation. What if I am a, uh, what if I'm selling you my property and there's a tenant farmer who is on that property, okay? They have a lease that lasts multiple years. You bought my property with that tenant farmer's lease. Are you going to have to respect that lease? Yes. Absolutely. You're going to have to respect that lease. And you know what else you're going to have to respect? They're going to drive across your property potentially to get their crop to where the crop is, they have to drive across your property to uh, get there. There's another word starting with the letter E that describes someone's right to cross your property to get where they're going. What's that word? An easement. You, we haven't introduced it yet. You'll see that coming up in just a moment. So implements refers not only to the crop in the field, but also the right of the person who planted it to reap it once the growing season has uh, matured. Does that make sense to you? At the end of the day, it's a level one vocabulary word. We're going to talk about a couple of things having to do with agricultural, uh, agriculture and real estate. And if I were you, I would understand it only topically. And once I got into the field, if I ran into a complicated situation, I would probably contact an attorney who handles that type of uh, transaction. But for our purposes, very simple. One growing season, crop, implement, the right of the person to reap it who sowed it. Good? I'm going to go ahead and caution you right now. In this class, I don't know why in real estate there are a lot of words that start with the letter E. And they're all important, but they don't mean anything close to each other. But sometimes when you're doing your vocabulary, think of strategies about how you study. Study, you know, put words together that have the same letter. Sometimes they look a lot alike when you're taking that full hour uh, test. Make sure you can distinguish between them. This may be the first one that we have uh, introduced. E's and M's. For some reason, a lot of real estate works begin with E's and M's. All right, you handle that pretty well. You're going to handle this pretty well. These are just vocabulary words to you. When we talk about property, we talk about the concept of severance versus annexation. When we talk about severance, do you recognize it derives from the word to sever, to cut off? So when we talk about severance in relation to real estate, we talk about removing something from the real property. That will be important here in just a few minutes as we talk about fixtures. Severance means, uh, uh, means to take something away from a property, detach it. Okay? And then when you look at the word annexation, when we talk about the word annexation, we're talking about attaching something to a property. Severance, taking away, annexation, adding on. You okay with that? You will see why that was important to us right here as we get into the next category. This is your first, really, level three category that we have talked about uh, so far. That is the category of fixtures. This is your first level three category. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. I bet you get this problem right on the exam. I just bet you do. Because we talk about it so much. It's something tangible that you can really put your hands on. So you're going to get this one right on the exam. Let's introduce fixtures. Here's my definition of uh, fixtures. An item that was once personal property that has become real property by virtue of its annexation. Don't say, well, what does annexation mean? I'll say, just refer back to the last slide, remember? To attach it to the property. Okay? 
an item that was once what? Personal property that has become real property by virtue of its annexation or attachment to the uh, property. Say again. Uh, don't say that one though. You and Ebony cannot talk for the next few minutes. Y'all are going to confuse people. All right? That was a good guess. That was a good guess. But wrong. Give me an example of a, um, uh, give me an example of a fish. Basketball goal that's attached how? In my driveway. In what? In the cement, there you go, right there. I'll give her a bonus point on that. That basketball goal, when you bought it at Dick's Sporting Goods store, it was just what? Personal, Personal property, but then you came home, and if it was like at my house, it probably would have sat in the garage for a long, long time. But then eventually, <laughs> then eventually, someone would have dug a hole, put cement in it, and then put it down, and that cement would have dried. And now that basketball goal is a what? It's Fixture. Fixture. It's staying with the property. Okay, how about those fancy lights in dining rooms? What are they called? Chandeliers. Chandeliers. They are, in fact, uh, fixtures. How about those whirly things that you see sometimes in rooms? What are they called? Ceiling fans. When they're attached to the house, they become fixtures, right? You're picturing it? I'm going to get back to yours in just a little bit, okay? All right, now, in teaching this, a lot of times people talk about uh, what's the most important determining factor of whether an item is a fixture or not. And then you will invariably say something like, well, the way it's attached. That is a fantastic answer. But it's not the one I'm looking for. Let me tell you the one I'm looking for. Let me remind you what the question was. My question is, what's the most important determinant factor whether an item is a fixture or not? And the answer is going to lie somewhere around page 274. Flip in your textbook to page 274-ish. Two, 274, 274. You guys look smart, so I'm going to go ahead and jump all the way to the back of the uh, book. Once you jump to page two, six, uh, 274, go two uh, pages farther into page 276. When you get to page 276, look in the middle of the page. In the middle of the page, you see the number two. And what word do you see beside the number two? <laughs> Fixtures. Okay, so here's what I'm going to tell you. In my world, the most important determinant factor of whether an item is a fixture or not is what the contract says. It's what the contract says, okay? So I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to see how well you have followed my guidance here. Is a ceiling fan in the dining room or in the living room or in the bedroom, is a ceiling fan a fixture? Yes. Why? Because it's in the contract, it's what the contract says. What's the contract say? Trust me, it says ceiling fans. <laughs> is a chandelier in the dining room, is a chandelier in the dining room a fixture? Yes. Why? Because it's in the contract. Daniel, you are brilliant. I'm going to tell everybody to study with you. Because it's in the contract. What's it say in the contract, Daniel? Um, no, actually, I didn't. You didn't read it. You're just I taking a shot, it, aren't you? It what does it say in the contract? It says light fixtures. Light fixtures. Light fixtures are in fact considered to be uh, fixtures. Now, let me tell you why I go this route with the contract. I'm going to ask you a question here. You should be looking at your fixtures provision. Reading it very quickly while I'm asking you this question right here. Do any of you have a garage at your home? I have a garage in my home. The way I enter this garage, is that I punch a button on a remote control and sometimes it opens the door. Okay, if we remember to place the battery, sometimes it opens the door. That remote control that I have is clipped on the visor in my car. Do any of you have a similar type situation? Yes. Right, so here's my question for you. Uh, the garage door is clearly a fixture. I think we're okay with that, right? How about that remote control? Is that remote control a fixture? Yes. Why? What does it say right there, Ebony? Um, under the specified items section, it's a state electric garage door openers with controls. Electric garage door openers with controls. Why are they considered to be a fixture? Because the contract says so. Is my remote control physically attached to anything? No. It is not, but it's a fixture anyway. 
Let me make one more less than subtle remark about this. Do any of you have gas log fireplace? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, my gas log fireplace has a, a hard, not wire, but a, a, it has a gas tube coming into it which feeds the uh, fireplace. It has a grate that it sits on which is all attached. Having said that, my gas logs are not physically attached to anything. But do my gas logs go with the house? Are they fixtures? Yes. Why? The because the contract says so. Okay? Now, a lot of people, when they teach this, they, they say, if you want to determine whether an item is a fixture or not, just take the house and turn it upside down, and if it falls out, it's personal property that stays in, it's a fixture. But that's not always the case, is that those gas logs will fall out, but there's still a, a fixture. That remote would fall off your kitchen table. It's still a fixture because the contract says so. Are you with me? Yes. Constance, why are you looking at me like that? Are you going to say something otherwise? No. Okay, you're just looking at me. Okay, I'll call on you if you're looking at me. Y'all remember that. <laughs> Keep your eyes down if you don't get called on. Okay, now as we continue forward though, there is a test that they will ask you when it comes to fixtures. And this will be important for test purposes as well. If there is ambiguity about whether an item is a fixture or not, you will look at what's known as the total circumstances test. I'm hoping that's on the next slide, is it? Yes, it is, in fact. When in doubt about whether an item is a fixture or not, consult the total circumstances test. The total circumstances test to determine whether an item is a fixture. Okay? One of the most common acronyms in all of real estate education is IRMA. This is the test. I think in the book they actually use Maria, but you'll see that there's similar letters. I like to use IRMA. I-R-M-A. And here's what the test takes into consideration. Now remember, if this contract says that it's a fixture, then by God, it's a fixture. But if you have any doubts, check this test. The first one, the I, stands for intention. What was the intention of the attacher at the time that they made the attachment? Did they mean for it to be permanent or did they mean for it to be temporary? I, the intention of the attachment. I got a shortcut for you when it comes to the intention of the attachment. One way to know the intention of the attacher is to just address it in the what? Contract. Because if it's addressed in the contract, we don't have to worry about this guessing stuff. But let me give you an example of one that might come up by happenstance. Let's say you're, there's a young couple. A young couple recently married. They buy their first house together. Naively, they think they're going to live there forever. Oh, it's our first home. We're going to stay here forever. No, you're not. If you did, the rest of us wouldn't make any money. We need you to move every three to five years. Okay? <laughs> So anyway, they buy this house. It's their house they bought together uh, when they married. They also bought themselves. They got some really nice china when they were uh, uh, for wedding presents and stuff. Does anybody still do china for weddings? Is that still the deal? Okay. Crap. I gotta buy a wedding present soon. And I know these people. Those pick something expensive. So you're not taking this part, are you? It's not, it's not sure it's fair. But anyway, they have some really nice china. And so what they do is they go out and get themselves a nice corner hutch to go to their brand new dining room. They're going to have a nice formal dining room. Can you picture it? They're going to have a corner hutch, which they're appropriately going to put in the corner. That's why they call it that. They're going to put all their china in there so it's nicely displayed for their formal dinner gatherings and stuff. They look at it and they say, you know what would look really good? If we took that, and we took at the top of it, we put crown molding to match the rest of the uh, dining room. Down at the bottom, they put in the uh, toe molding the chair about halfway up so that it matches the rest of the dining room. Are you visualizing what's going on here? Right on schedule, five years down the road, they decide to sell their house. Their family's getting bigger, they need more room, they decide to sell their uh, home. What do you think they want to do about that hutch that they bought for their wedding present? That's sentimental and it has their china on it. What do you think they're thinking about doing with that hutch? You think they might take it with them? Okay. Now, let's look at the buyer for just a moment. Five years down the road, a new buyer comes in, they're looking at this, and they walk through the house, they see everything, they make an offer on the property, they go under contract, they come back for the final walkthrough. And here's the conversation. 
Honey, the dining room feels bigger than what it did last time we got saw it. What's up with that? The corner touch is missing. That's what's up with that. If you're the buyer, are you ticked? Yeah, I'm ticked. Because what does that corner hutch look like to you? It looks like a fixture. Did anybody use the word built-in? I thought that was what you had said over there. It looks like a built-in. And there we have a special significance of built-in. Most things are typically considered to be our fixtures if it is, in fact, built-in. Like a built-in bookshelf as opposed to one you just assemble and put against the wall, right? Okay, so the buyers are ticked. And I think rightfully so. But in fairness to the sellers, I mean, come on, this had sentimental value to them. It had a lot of actual value to them. Do you blame the sellers for taking it? Do you blame the buyers for being mad? Who's going to win? <clears throat> in my world, the buyer wins. In my world, the buyer wins in this particular case. If for some crazy reason this ended up in court, then I think the judge would look at it and say, man, i got to be honest with you, sellers. When you put that in five years ago, it looks like you meant for it to be permanent. Okay? Now, maybe you didn't plan on selling five years later, but to everybody from the outside, it looks like that was a permanent attachment. And the courts could say, boom, we signed for the buyers. Now, I have to be honest with you, the sellers are still not putting that much back. But they would have to replace it with something of like value, okay, in a good and working like manner. Yeah? So, but in the, like, if the buyer, if the sellers were communicating properly with the seller's agent, they could have put that as an exclusion in the contract or something? Yes, and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a uh, second. What Ann said is exactly true. There is a way to handle this by the contract. By the contract. And so that's why you can remove all the ambiguity by just making sure all this is addressed in the contract. And we'll show you where physically that you can put this in the uh, contract, okay? Now, Ann, I don't know what world she lives in that she thinks that buyers and sellers and agents actually communicate but I want you to understand, this is not fantasy land. So sometimes people will not communicate as they should, and that's how you run into these problems. Take control, help explain this. I honestly believe today, you know, when I started in the business 25 years ago, I had something as an agent that the rest of the population didn't have. MLS was not online. I actually had our inventory in books. If you want to see houses, you had to come to me to see houses. Well, today, this information is everywhere. I mean, you can go to Zillow's, Trulia's, thousands, hundreds of thousands of websites, and buyers and sellers can get and trade information on it. So I think today our biggest job as agents is educating and managing projects. I think we're actually project managers more than anything else today. So, and we have to make sure that these communities, sometimes, and you literally have to look someone in the eyes and say, you do understand that this is the status of this particular item, whatever it is. And you know, make sure that they are engaged with you. Because they're thinking about other things. They're thinking about putting money in their pocket, buying their beach house or whatever it is. So you have to keep them really focused. Education is a big part of the game today for us. Sam, go ahead. If, they, if the sellers had to put the crown molding on it, would it have been a problem? I mean, would it you know, as I uh, made up the uh, story as I was going along there, I was trying to make it so you understood that it was the build-in because the farther we get back from that, the more likely it is that it's personal versus real. And I didn't poll the class, but in some classes that are smaller, sometimes I poll the class, and some people actually side with the seller. What they actually say is, come on, I mean, surely anybody would have known that that had special significance to them, so they would have asked that uh, question. So I set it up to, to go a particular way. But having said that, yeah, exactly, in the field, have these conversations. And I'm going to leave you with one last thought about the intention of the attachment. And it is this. In my old textbook that I used to use, there was a line in the book that said, courts have not been consistent when applying the total circumstances test. I'm like, well, if courts can't be consistent applying the total circumstances test, what chance do we have as agents? So, finally, my comment is, if you want to take the ambiguity out of it, address it in the contract, and then you don't have to worry about it. And as we talk through this exercise, what you'll think is, my gosh, I'm going to have to have a contract that's 40 pages long to address all of it. You really don't. In any house, it's going to be one, two, three things. 
maybe. You're not going to have all the things we talk about in every given house. Sometimes it's going to be obvious what the circumstances are. Okay? Intention of the attacher. If you can determine the intention of the attacher, that actually would have been the most important thing after the contract. Okay? And actually, the contract is part of the intention. If it's written in the contract, that is actually part of the intent. It explains the intent of the form. Okay? The other is very straightforward. For example, when I talk about the relationship of the attacher, keep it simple. Ask yourself this question. Was it attached by an owner or was it attached by a tenant? And try to determine whether something is a fixture or not. Was it attached by an owner or was it attached by a tenant? Is this answer already fairly obvious? Yes. Okay? If an owner attached it to the property in a way as to indicate permanence, it's a fixture by God. See, I. Okay? On the other hand, how about this? A tenant basically has this conversation with you, with the owner. Uh, listen, I like the house. I'm going to rent the house. I don't like high electric bills. I notice you don't have any ceiling fans in any of your bedrooms. Would you mind if I, the tent, would you mind if I put up ceiling fans? If you read the fixtures paragraph close enough, which you don't have to do right now, you'll get ample opportunity to later. But the background behind the fixtures paragraph is it basically says this. The following items, if any, and if owned by the seller, will convey with the property. Notice that. The first thing is the following items, if any. If that, of that list of fixtures, if there are some things listed that you don't have, well, you don't have to go buy them and attach them to the house. It's the following items, if they exist, are considered fixtures. But the following items, if any, and if owned, owned by whom? The seller. If owned by the person who's selling the house, then it's a fixture. Let me give you an example. Can you think of anything off the top of your head that might be attached to a house, and don't worry about house attached, it's just attached to the house, uh, that might not be owned by the seller. Can you give me a couple of examples? What'd you say? Satellite, I heard. Satellite dish could be leased, right? What'd you say? Security system, they could be leased. The electric uh, dog fences may, may, not be, may or may not be leased. Water filtration systems may or may not be leased. Okay, the biggie today is fuel tanks. When I actually ask you to read the offer to purchase contract, you will see that the word fuel tanks in the first two or three pages of the contract comes up six different times. Do you know why it comes up six different times? So many mistakes, so many potential suits or complaints have been around fuel tanks. Because here it is, you have a propane tank when the buyer looks at the house, there's a propane tank that runs your stove or your uh, uh, fireplace or something like that. The buyer's buying the house thinking he's getting that fuel tank. If the seller doesn't own that fuel tank, he can't sell that fuel tank. It might be owned by the fuel company, the uh, oil company, okay? So that's what we mean by the relationship of the attachment. Did an owner attach it? If an owner owns it and attaches it to the property, it's a fixture. But by God, if it's a lease, Thing or if a tenant attached it, it's not necessarily a fixture. When we get to chapter 7, I will beat you about the head with the concept of material facts. There are some things that the buyer needs to know. Buyer, you need to understand that that security system, that water filtration system, that fuel tank does not go with the property. It's leased by this company. If you would like to have that service, you need to contact them. Not me. I don't own it. I can't sell it to you. Does that make sense? All right. Intention of the attacher, relationship of the attacher. Total circumstances test M stands for the method of attachment. Method of attachment. How was it attached to the house? Was it attached in such a way as to indicate permanence? Or was it attached to show that it was just a temporary attachment? Here's some good news for you. All those lovely pictures of your kids that you have on the wall. You can take them with you because they are typically up there only by a small brad or maybe a 3M sticker or something like that. On the other hand, if you want to get rid of one of the kids, take and attach them to the wall and they go with the property. That's just a joke. That's just a joke. But you can see that clearly is temporary, right? However, let me tell you the one that always befuddles me. You guys look smarter than I am, so I'm assuming you will not have this problem. If you were to look in the uh, fixtures paragraph, you would see the way it refers to mirrors. It refers to wall 
and or door mirrors are, uh, uh, are considered fixtures, okay? I don't know why, but I have it in my mind. Any mirror in a bathroom, I consider that to be a fixture. You take that exact same mirror, you know the one that's oval and it's kind of plated around the side, it's decorative. You take that exact same mirror and put it in a foyer, and I believe that it's a uh, personal property, it's art, okay? That's not what the contract says. The contract says wall and or door mirrors are, in fact, considered to be fixtures. So what I'm telling you is, you better be careful. You better be careful. If that mirror has value and there could be something to get into an argument about, either write it in the contract or take it down if your seller wants to take it out with them. Method of attachment. This is a good guide, but it's not a perfect guide. Do you realize there are some things that are not attached to the house that might be considered uh, fixtures? I actually had an argument come up one time about it was a piece of artwork that was out in the back of this house. It was a pretty nice uh, house, and they had a little garden area back behind the house, and they had a fountain. This fountain, of course, was a block fountain. had water in it, had a liner in it. It uh, has a fountain that uh, comes up. It had lights. They had put lights around it. And the seller's thought was that, I'm going to take this with me. I'm just simply going to break it down. Not the water, obviously. It's just filled up with water when it gets where he's going. But I'm going to break it down, take it with me, and I'll just set it up at the house I'm going. Well, the buyer saw that and assumed that it was a fixture, that it goes with the landscaping on this. Who's right? Who's right? Biden is right. I think so. I would probably lean toward the Biden in this particular case. I sat down and talked to the seller about this, and in the end, he, he said, I can kind of see your point of view. I can see where a buyer, given the intricacy with the way this was put together, and the overall weight. I mean, literally, this was not attached to anything other than by gravity, but because of the way it uh, looked, the seller eventually came around and said, you know what, that's fine. We'll leave it. We'll just go buy the parts to make another one wherever we're going. I think that was probably the right move in this case. Method of attachment, okay? Not perfect, but not bad, okay? And then also in determining whether an item is a uh, fixture, the concept of adaptation, the A for adaptation, you might also want to put parenthetically beside that customization. Was it so customized, was it so adapted for that particular use that it would make sense for it to be uh, that it would make sense for it to be nothing other than a fixture, okay? Let me give you two quick examples of this. Two quick examples of this. Uh, have you ever seen cabinetry that is built in such a way that it has a microwave? Now, my microwave in my house is actually mounted underneath the, uh, above the stove, underneath the, the vent, okay? That's the way most of them are. But in some cases, they will build cabinetry and so that you just slide a, uh, uh, a microwave oven into it, and it has a special prong at the back of it for you to uh, plug it in. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, that microwave is not actually attached to anything. It is slid into place. But what was the sole purpose for which that spot was built into the cabinetry? Microwave. It would make sense for nothing to go there other than a microwave. Okay. In that case, it was so customized that I believe that it actually probably would be considered a fixture if it ever came down to it, okay? Do you see where that's different? The microwave itself would be a fixture, even though technically it's not attached to anything. Again, it's getting back towards that idea of built-in in this case. Um, do you see the difference? The one that's mounted, there's no argument about the one that's mounted.